Right. Um, hi, I'm Kevin. Uh, thanks to the organizers and thanks everyone uh, who stuck around to the end to, to hear these last few talks. Um, so I kind of operate in the USV world um, in kind of two different spaces. So one as the developer of Deep Squeak, um, was very interested in like the nitty gritty of uh, USB detection and classification and kind of thing. Um, but I'm also a behavioral neuroscientist. And so um, I use USVs kind of as a simple uh, behavioral metric to improve uh, my models, uh, mostly of uh, fentanyl use. So today I'm going to talk mostly about uh, kind of the neuroscience side of things or the behavior side of things um, and just a little bit about deep squeak. Um, so hopefully you still find that interesting. Great. Um, so for those of you who are not American, so sorry. Oh, what's better? Yeah, you can wait on. Yeah. Cool. Um, in the United States, uh, opioid overdose is a, a serious public health concern. Um, and it's often described in these kind of three phases of um, an increase in prescription opioid use and then an increase in heroin and finally um, an increase in synthetic opioid use. But this is a really out of date figure at this point. Uh, and since the pandemic, there's been uh, one drug that's kind of taken over um, the market and that's fentanyl. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in um, improving uh, treatments for fentanyl. Um, why, why is fentanyl so different and why is it taken off so much? Well, I think it's pretty simple. It's uh, very cheap, very potent and readily available. And so it's commonly used as an adulterant for more expensive drugs, um, but it's also uh, really a drug of choice now for most users um, because it's so cheap and potent. And uh, there's one more theory I wanna kinda uh, everyone to have a grasp on before I go into the um, ultrasonic localization side of things. So that's the um, effective opponent, opponent process. Um, so. It's the idea that drugs of abuse um, kind of have this two-stage process where uh, the initial pleasurable um, uh, feelings uh, drive seeking, and then over a period of um, you know kind of cycles of use and disuse, there's um, negative uh, affective state that takes over and drives uh, drug seeking to kind of avoid that negative affective state. And this is commonly thought to occur over uh, like cycles, longer periods of time. Uh, all right, so you know what can we do as neuroscientists to help? So I'll be the first to admit that the opioid crisis in the United States is going to require um, pretty massive um, improvements to healthcare and housing and social services. Um, but you know we still want to um, do our part in the sciences, and so the uh, kind of like mainstay of uh, addiction neuroscience is looking for uh, these changes that occur in the brain with chronic use. Um, but something I'm really interested in, so uh, 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 pretty much, you know, every rat will take uh, will take drugs, and uh, a lot of people use drugs, but then don't become uh, severely addicted or have uh, problematic use. And so, I'm really curious about what are the uh, individual differences in um, neurobiology that can help us predict addiction susceptibility, because um, prevention is always going to be easier than treatment. Um, so to do this, to, to answer these questions, uh, we rely on um, preclinical behavioral models uh, in rats and mice. Um, I work primarily in rats now. Um, the kind of gold standard for uh, these preclinical models is the IV and vapor self-administration models. Um, these are uh, good, stable models. They're also very complicated and require surgeries or um, expensive equipment, um, often single housing for animals with things like backpack catheters. Um, and so it's difficult for labs to get into this. Um, it can kind of be a deterrent to um, accelerating uh, the use of these models. And so for the last couple of years, what I've been focused on um, is developing a oral self-administration model. So fentanyl, again, because it's so potent and readily absorbed through the oral mucosa, um, it lends itself to this uh, simple uh, oral model where the animals can take um, small boluses of drug, um, have it absorb in the mouth. Um, so this model um, is a very simple uh, behavioral model. It's just a lever press model, FR1. Um, we give them uh, 70 micrograms per milliliter rewards, very small 0 0.05 milliliter rewards, uh, along with a compound Q. Um, and I think the key here is the saccharin fade that we add during the first week um, to help animals kind of consume enough early on so that they understand what they're taking uh, is fentanyl. Um, and if you do this, you get um, really robust taking in male and female rats. 
Um, we just use a three week uh, kind of five days on two day off model, followed by uh, seven days of extinction and then a reinstatement test to see if animals will reinstate to the queue. Um, and I guess I'm a pointer, but um, we see really, you know, classical um, acceleration of intake, uh, uh, a drop in pressing during the um, uh, extinction period and a reinstatement to, uh, to queues. Um, the animals are also taking pretty equivalent doses to um, the, the IV and fentanyl models, and um, they form really strong associations between uh, cues and the rewards. So we see um, basically a, a, an increase in um, seeking and head entries during reinstatement, and we also see a decrease um, in head entry latency from extinction. So this is the time between uh, hearing the tone and going to collect the reward. Um, and then just to be extra sure that this uh, was a good stable model, uh, we did some uh, 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 behavioral economics testing. So this is where you take the animals um, and during the fourth week of self-administration, you lower the dose uh, repeatedly. So you start at a high dose and then you lower it uh, throughout the week. And animals will uh, increase lever pressing uh, to compensate for that lower dose. And they'll maintain stable intake across a really wide uh, range of doses, only um, dropping off when the dose gets very, very small and the cost gets very high. Uh, and finally, we just show that these uh, animals uh, are, are taking a dose that's antinociceptive. So it's, you know, it is a, a pain relieving dose. Um, what about individual differences? So this is something um, I'm really excited about. Uh, most of my kind of past work in drugs, we look for these big group changes. Um, but in this model, we see um, nice kind of normal distributions of intake across uh, uh, a variety of different kind of components of self-administration, I'd say. So um, we've kind of uh, broken down different behaviors like uh, seeking uh, uh, association, so the, the head entry latency, escalation, how much uh, uh, are they increasing their intake over days, the speed of that intake. Um, if you take these different uh, behavioral components and you put them into a principal component analysis with uh, uh, representation of kind of the individual uh, uh, pieces of the, of the PCA, uh, what we find is that male and female rats, uh, uh, the high risk kind of animals, are actually in, in distinct trajectories. So the, the male rats tend to be um, higher, um, higher, you know, intake animals. Uh, they escalate faster and they're doing more um, head entry, so they're seeking a lot. But the females have um, higher um, uh, uh, associations, so that's uh, lower Q latency. Uh, uh, more pressing during extinction, so perseverance uh, to the lever press, and they're relapsing more. Um, okay, thank you for sitting through the non-USV part of it. So we did, in fact, record ultrasonic vocalizations for this entire project um, and use Deep Squeak to analyze them. Uh, for those of you who have not um, seen Deep Squeak since 2019 when it came out, um, we have been kind of quietly um, updating the software maybe once a year for the last uh, three or four years. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, the, the new software uses some uh, brand new detection architecture, um, uh, YOLO instead of uh, RCNN. Uh, the biggest kind of most important change is that it allows you to navigate entire audio files. Um, so you can load a fresh audio file in, scroll through it, um, change the boxes if it misses things, um, add new boxes. This helps with um, training new ne uh, networks, things like that. Um, and then in the last year or so, we um, improved our clustering with um, contour invariant clustering using variational autoencoders. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and improved our clustering GUI um, to make it easier to remove noise or change categories um, within the clustering GUI. Okay, so classification. Um, classification is hard. I don't think I need to convince anyone here that classification is hard. Uh, I think a big piece of that is that um, there's really good evidence recently that USVs don't, mouse and rat USVs in particular, don't actually separate into distinct categories and kind of exist in this um, continuum and feature space. Um, a big paper just came out, uh, maybe it, was, it must have been two years ago at this point, but um, showing different, um, different vocal repertoires from different animals, and some cluster really neatly into discrete categories, and they just were never able to get um, rat and mouse USVs to do that. So how does Deep Squeak uh, kind of tackle this problem? So uh, I personally have kind of given up on uh, supervised clustering, so experimenter-derived categories. Um, we use an entirely unsupervised approach um, where we let the, um, the software kind of just pick how many categories there are. Um, so originally to do that, we had um, 
this contour parameterization method where deep squeak would uh, try to find the contour of the call and then uh, using some uh, basic parameters of that contour, uh, you could use k-means or whatever you wanted to break it up into different categories. Uh, that worked very well for um, calls that are kind of, you know, like uh, tonal, um, but for trills that don't have a very discrete contour, it's not very useful. Um, then this paper came out uh, in 2021 that showed um, they could do better clustering by feeding uh, spectrograms into something called a variational autoencoder. So it's a type of neural network used in uh, um, generative um, uh, uh, conditions. But basically, uh, you can just feed the spectrogram uh, to the neural network, and it will reduce uh, the spectrogram down to a set of latent variables um, that you can put into uh, clustering analysis. And this works really well for um, most calls, but uh, in rats in particular, we have this issue with long 22s. They're very hard to scale appropriately um, to fit into these kind of um, uh, 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 spectrogram-based uh, approaches. And so what we thought is, well, why don't we just uh, take the best of both worlds and mash these together? Um, so the newest version of DeepSqueak, if you try to do clustering, um, it's going to recommend that you use this approach. Um, and I think uh, we can finally actually go on to, um, oh, just just to uh, give a little a shameless plug, I love Deep Squeak and want to keep developing. Um, I am starting a lab and it is extremely difficult to do software development. Um, if uh, anyone knows anyone that's really interested in this kind of um, uh, USVs and is a good MATLAB coder, and uh, we uh, hopefully will be recruiting in the next uh, six months to a year. Um, but we have a development pipeline. We have ideas for what we're going to do. Um, and basically, that's to allow for audio recording in the app, uh, real-time detection and classification. Um, we know that that's possible with um, Deep Squeak because we've we've built kind of um, uh, not so good versions of it, but you know, prototype versions of it. Um, and we want to improve all this clustering, contour parameterization, um, detection flexibility. Uh, I think Deep Squeak uses some pretty outdated um, techniques for actually detecting, uh, and I think that would be a pretty easy uh, upgrade. Uh, so, anyways. Um, so what did we find during the fentanyl self-administration? Um, so Deep Squeak decided, okay, there are there are 12 categories of USBs. I've labeled them here, but this is basically just for convenience. Um, this would just be coming out as, you know, 1 through 12 um, um, from Deep Squeak. So like I mentioned before, most of the high-frequency calls, the 50 kilohertz, you know, range calls, don't um, cluster discreetly into nice little categories. Um, but it's still really useful uh, to do so. Obviously, we all want to... Um, you know, look at when calls are made and if they're used in different conditions. Um, except I should say the 22 kilohertz calls very clearly um, kind of exist in their own in their own world and feature space. Um, so what we thought is let's look at these calls uh, across time during self-administration. And what we noticed is that uh, basically all of the high-frequency calls, the 50s, are used interchangeably early in the session. So from kind of a minute negative five before the session starts to about 30 minutes in, animals are making positive calls, uh, 50 kilohertz calls, and then they switch over to uh, the 22 kilohertz long calls later in the session. Um, and this pattern holds true in training, extinction, and reinstatement, which is kind of interesting. Um, but it's compressed during extinction, things go, go much faster. And so we thought, okay, why, why is this pattern emerging? Um, so to make things easier on ourselves, we just uh, collapsed all of the high frequency calls into the, you know, the usual positive effective USVs and negative effective USVs. Um, and as you can see, there's this same pattern. We have all the positive calls occurring early in the session and then a shift uh, to, to 22 kilohertz calls later in the session. Um, so to get at like why the shift is occurring, um, I need to bring up um, this uh, kind of feature of uh, substance uh, use. So in animal models, um, animals tend to uh, take drugs in this patterned way where there's a loading phase early in the session uh, with very um, rapid responding. Uh, and then they shift to slower, more stable responding. So you get this uh, nice steep area here. And then uh, if you try to model the drug level, what you'll notice is a rapid increase in drug. And then uh, the brain levels kind of fluctuate as the animal hits, hits, hits to, to, to maintain that stable level. Um, and if you look at it across sessions, um, this is basically just to show you that this, this uh, stable loading and maintenance pattern um, occurs, you know, whether they're taking a lot of drug or a little drug early on you're gonna see the same pattern just basically shifted down lower drug levels later, higher drug levels later, very high drug levels. Um, 
And if you take the USVs and you line them up, uh, you kind of suddenly notice something. So that's that the positive effective USVs are occurring all during the loading phase and the negative effective USVs are occurring during this maintenance phase. And so what we think is happening is um, as opposed to the, the normal idea that the effective opponent process um, kind of manifests over many, many uh, weeks of drug taking, we see right away a shift from positive reinforcement early in the session uh, to negative reinforcement later in the session. So as soon as the animal's drug level gets up uh, to what we used to call like their preferred drug level, um, it turns out that that uh, is, a, is a kind of an aversive experience and the animals may be uh, pressing to escape the, the falling drug level um, and so they can hold it uh, stable. Um, I think that's all I'm going to go through just uh, to, to, to bring it all together. Uh, we're really excited about this new oral fentanyl self-administration model and how easy it's going to make uh, getting into this for certain labs. Um, the models really uh, faithfully captures uh, escalation of intake, cue association, relapse, and demand inelasticity. These are kind of key features of, of fentanyl use that we needed to model. And we've shown using USVs that uh, there's, a, there's a very rapid within session opponent process here, a uh, very rapid switch from positive reinforcement to negative reinforcement. Um, and in the future, basically the idea is to go after, you know, what areas of the brain are processing this switch? Um, can we manipulate them? Can we reduce, say, the negative effective uh, components here and reduce uh, propensity to take drug and to relapse? All right, um, big thank you to my uh, uh, mentor's lab, John. Uh, he was pretty instrumental in um, helping me uh, get my kind of first grants and uh, uh, get, a, get a job at University of Washington. So I'm really happy uh, for all of them. And also a big thank you to um, all the people that have like donated USVs to Deep Squeak over the years. Um, some of you have donated USVs, others have just put them online for free. Uh, thank you, MouseTube. Um, we've definitely used a lot of USVs from a lot of labs in the development. So yeah, questions? Have no yeah, time. It, yeah, that was great, perfect on time. All right, so do we have a questions? Just to, all right, we got one online. I have used Deep Squeak, and I believe it's one of the best tools. Uh, would be a shame for the field of USVs if you were to stop developing. <laughs> I would love to try version like, four point the question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, yeah, please, if anyone knows good MATLAB programmers that... Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, I'll go ahead. All right, thanks. Thanks for your talk. It's very interesting. I'm I'm quite new to the field, so maybe it's a silly question. But is it possible that they are just um, when they got the drugs that they are just unable to get to hit the bar more? So uh, um, that does happen on occasion with some drugs. Um, in this fentanyl procedure, no, they're very uh, mobile. Um, yeah, they're they're true. still totally active. Um, just like they, basically every animal has a level that they they hit and then stay there. Yeah. Um, the doses are also pretty small, so. Right. Um, it would take like they'd have to do it really very fast. And, because it seems strange that they have this negative, make this negative calls, and then still, even though they've experienced something negative, they don't hit it harder or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. Okay. Um, so you can, um, with like catheters, you can uh, 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 hold drug level stable at a certain mm -hmm. spot. And uh, David, who's going to talk after me, has done this before. Um, I, I believe he has a USB for this. Anyways, they'll they'll basically press relentlessly if you hold them at that level. They'll press like yeah. thousands of times um, to try to get back to this like you know preferred preferred level. Okay. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, unsupervised uh, version of Deep Squeak will mean that different labs will um, get different results. Will it be possible to compare across labs or yeah. even within a lab? Um, so. What the unsupervised version allows you to do is you can save um, you can save the the like clustering model afterward, and you can use it repeatedly. So it was unsupervised and it was generated, yep. uh, but then you could share it and use it across labs. Wow. Um, yeah, so far we basically with every new project rerun it because um, you know I mean different species, different um, strains, things like that. 
Um, it's very hard to, um, yeah. I wish there was a better way for us all to be consistent with clustering because particularly for things like syntax, um, like every decision made at the clustering step is going to affect, you know, downstream ordering analysis. And so that's a, it's like a mess in the, in the field. Thank you. Yeah. I can read, thank you. So I, I think I asked him when you in the deep squeak a few years ago about <laughs> you don't you don't have to remember but so the, the contour based analysis cannot really capture the the harmonics right and I think you said so you have an idea to like solve this problem yeah I mean they um uh the, the contour invariant variation auto encoders should capture the harmonics um I'm kind of just generally fussy about harmonics and try to pretend like they don't exist or aren't some separate thing than the regular calls. Um, but uh, that that should be useful, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the talk. So I have a question about the clustering. Okay. So um, how would you determine which clustering to use? Because uh, the data could be different from, you know, from sources is different. The aim of the experiment would be different. So how would Deep Squeak like really decide the clustering method? And could we, as the lab, change that? And Yeah, so, so far we have built in, um, uh, you know, neural network-based clustering. The uh, talk earlier talked about that. Um, so you can do your own manual scoring and, and create a... Um, uh, a neural network that'll cluster based on your categories. You can do just the contour. Um, you can do the contour plus the variational autoencoder. Um, and I think there's some legacy stuff in there too. So basically it's just, you know, we just try things and see what works the best, honestly. And that's not necessarily the, you know, maybe the right call, but um, I, I like to have more options, I guess, than less. Yeah. 